that you're here with us today. How many of you know the presence of the Lord is here with us? So what an amazing time in worship this morning. I have a word from the Lord to share with you this morning. I'm uh, going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to go all the way to the end of the chapter, the last verse of 1 Corinthians 15 and the first few verses of chapter 16. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about go big before you go home. Go big before you go home. 1 Corinthians 15, all the way at the end, you can find your way there. Uh, while you're finding your way to that chapter, uh, a couple quick things. First of all, uh, sad reminder that next weekend will be Pastor Kevin Zarika's last weekend with us here at Harvest Time. Pastor Kevin has accepted uh, an appointment from our National Youth Department. He's going to be a representative uh, for our National Department to all the churches in Southern New England. So Kevin is leaving us. He's not going too far. He's going to the district office in Sturbridge, Massachusetts. And uh, he's still going to be working with Harvest Time and with all the churches in our district. Uh, Pastor Kevin will be sharing the word and all the services next weekend. And then we're going to receive an offering for him because he's going as a missionary and he has to raise his own support uh, for the new uh, door the Lord has opened for him. We're going to be supporting him on a monthly basis as one of our missionaries, but we want to send him with all of our love and all of our blessings. And I'd like to ask you to just keep us in prayer. The board and I and our pastors are uh, currently pursuing a candidate to come and serve as our next youth pastor here at Harvest Time. And so just be in prayer that uh, the Lord will just uh, help us to connect with the right person to come and carry our young people forward. Um, also want to just mention the Ukraine dinner on Friday the 29th. Come. Uh, we'll have a great time. We'll have a little pasta and a little meatballs. Uh, my father-in-law is speaking. Uh, one of the best men that I have ever known. And uh, he's very humble. Um, he's very simple. But the, the touch of God is on him when he speaks. Uh, he was born with deformed feet. And his mother took him to the Pentecostal church. And they laid hands on him and prayed on him. And the Lord instantly healed his feet in front of everybody. And uh, when you received a touch from God like that, you carry it with you. And um, I don't know, maybe after we eat some pasta and some meatballs, maybe we'll have a little healing service to end the night. But we hope maybe you'll be with us and it's going to be a great evening together. All right, look with me in 1 Corinthians 15, last verse of the chapter. Go big before you go home. 1 Corinthians 15, reading in verse 58. Therefore... My dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Look at chapter 16 and verse 1. Now about the collection for God's people, do what I directed the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no special collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I'll give letters of introduction to the men that you approve, and I will send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I'll stay with you for a while, or even spend the winter, so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go next. For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost, because a great door for effective work remains open for me, but there are many who oppose me. Let's pray and just ask the Holy Spirit to come and just touch us as we receive his word. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people that you love so much. Father, thank you for your presence here. I pray that we would encounter you through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you just say amen and amen with me. Go big or go home. Every one of us needs a moment in life when those words resonate in our spirit. Go big or go home means whatever you do in life, give it your all. Always rise to the challenge. 
Give whatever it takes to win. Risk everything. Expend everything. Give it all you've got. Be extravagant in your effort. Be excellent. You know, go big or go home is the code of champions. In fact, it's the way of life of champions. For a few minutes today, I want to share some words of passion with you, and I want to share some words of vision. And I realize that not everyone might understand, not everyone might agree, but I pray that what I share from my heart will resonate with somebody here, and it will make a difference in your life. I don't know whether you've noticed, but that hole outside, it is really big. In fact, I swear every time I look out the window, it has grown bigger on me. Almost to the point that it makes my knees wobble a little bit. A few days ago, I texted a photo of the hole to our district superintendent, Pastor Bob, and I wrote to him, what have we gotten ourselves into? Immediately, he texted me back and he said, now you know why the words holy, holy, holy are followed by Lord God Almighty. <laughs> and I have to tell you the truth, I've been praying that ever since. Lord God Almighty, help us because we got a great big holy, holy, holy out there. <laughs> this project is big. It is very big. And I have to tell you the truth, I believe that it should be. I believe that big is what harvest time is supposed to be. I believe that big is what we are all supposed to be in Christ. We are all meant to make a big difference in someone's life. We are meant to make a big difference in God's world. My prayer is that someone's heart today would resonate with some big theology. Do you know that big is in the very nature of our great God? In the beginning, he created a whole big expanse of starry universe just to support life on this little green and blue marble called planet Earth. He created a big sky and big oceans and big mountains on big continents and he filled them with a very big variety and quantity of living creatures. From the dust of the earth he created mankind and he endowed him with a big capacity to think and to feel and to relate and to communicate and to create unlike any other living creature. And he blessed Adam and Eve and he commanded them to go forth and to fill the earth with a big population and they went forth. But because of Adam's disobedience to God, this big population of humanity was left with a big problem on its hands, sin and its big consequence of death. So now here we are. We live in the suburbs of one of the world's biggest cities and certainly the world's most famous. It's full of big buildings and big things. Specifically, God has called us to this community of Greenwich that has a big reputation. Big people live here. They have big names and big personalities and big ambitions and they're doing big things in the world and I don't know whether you've noticed but they live in some big houses. <laughs> And I think that there ought to be a spirit-filled church here that has a big influence in this region and is doing big things in God's world. It has been said that bigger is not better. And you know, it's true. Bigger is not better. Better is better. But when a church gets better, it gets bigger. When a church gets better, it starts making big changes in people's lives one at a time. Do you know, no matter how big a church building might be, people come through the door only one at a time. No matter how many seats in the sanctuary, only one person at a time sits in each seat. 
People only come to the altar one at a time. People only come to Christ one at a time. People only get delivered from sin one at a time. People only get water baptized one at a time. People only receive the good gift of the Holy Spirit one at a time. But when a church gets better, that just keeps happening more and more. When a church gets better, its ministries get bigger. Its scope of services to people gets bigger. Its capacity to serve more people gets bigger. Its pool of people resources gets bigger. Its pool of financial resources gets bigger. When a church gets better, its sphere of influence gets bigger. Its impact on the community gets bigger. Its impact on God's world gets bigger. Harvest time, I believe that God wants us to think big. We live in a big country with a big economy and there are still big opportunities. The American church is still big and it still has a very big capacity to do God's work in the world and we have big news to tell the world of a great God who has a big heart full of love so big that he sent his only son Jesus to die on the cross to meet the world's biggest need. God wants us to dream big. God wants us to plan big. God wants us to live big. God wants us to achieve big. And this is my prayer, that we would all go big before we go home. I pray that we would catch a vision to accomplish significant things for God here on earth so that we might receive from him a big welcome home and a big reward when we go to heaven. You know, Paul was a big thinker and a big dreamer too. He wrote to the Corinthians, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know your labor is not in vain, you will be rewarded with eternal life. Go big before you go home. Paul had big plans to spread the gospel from Turkey to Greece, and then from Greece to Rome, and then from Rome to Spain, which was literally the ends of the earth in his day. Paul also had a big project on his heart to raise a big sum of money for the suffering Christians in Jerusalem. This is the collection for God's people that Paul is discussing here in the first few verses of chapter 16. You know, after I preached the great resurrection passage on Easter Sunday, uh, I thought we were going to be all done with 1 Corinthians. My plan was to move on. But about two weeks ago, the Holy Spirit started giving me this download. And from a very unlikely text, the Holy Spirit has given me a word to share with you today about going big. Looking at Paul's instructions for the collection, I see some principles for going big before you go home, and I want to share them with you quickly. Principles for going big before you go home. First, this. If you want to go big, become part of something bigger than yourself. If you want to go big, become part of something bigger than yourself. We've been studying 1 Corinthians since last September, almost the whole school year. And we've discovered that one source of their many problems as a church was that they were quite myopic. In their eyes, the whole universe revolved around them. In their own eyes, they looked pretty good. They looked pretty spiritual. In fact, they thought that they had surpassed their father in the Lord, Paul. They were so focused on the goings-on in their own little church that they forgot there was a whole big world out there. They forgot that they were part of something much bigger than themselves. They were part of the kingdom of God on earth, the church Catholic. So Paul starts out this letter immediately reminding them, you're a part of something bigger. And he keeps reminding them of that throughout this whole letter. This is what we teach in all the churches. This is the rule we lay down in all the churches. This is how we do it in all the churches. 
And here again, at the very end of this letter in chapter 16, Paul is reminding them that they are part of something bigger than themselves. He reminds them in chapter 16 that they belong to the believers in Macedonia, the Christians in Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. He reminds them that they belong to the believers in Asia, in Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum, Philadelphia, Thyatira, Sar Sardis, Laodicea. He reminds them that they belong to the believers in Galatia. And he reminds them that they belong especially to the believers in Jerusalem. And maybe that's why Paul pressed on them to participate in this big collection for the suffering Christians in Jerusalem to lift their eyes off of themselves and to give them a vision to be part of something bigger. Paul says, do exactly what I directed the Galatians to do. Each one of you bring an offering to church each Sunday and become part of this big thing. And here's the principle for all of us. If you want to go big before you go home, become part of something bigger than yourself. Namely, become part of the kingdom of God on earth. Become part of his church. Become part of the Missio Dei, the mission of God to save people on earth. Do you know that working with other believers, you will accomplish far more than you could ever accomplish on your own. There wasn't much that one person could do to meet the needs of the entire Jerusalem church. But Paul said if each one would participate, then working together, they could accomplish something big. And they did. And working together, we can do some big things in the world too. We already have and we will yet. Working with other believers, you will leave a legacy that will last long after your lifetime. You know, the world might have never remembered an ambitious young Jew named Saul. But after an encounter with Jesus Christ, Saul changed his name to Paul, which means little. Here's a truth to embrace. If you want to go big, forgo chasing a big name for yourself. Paul became part of something bigger than himself and by doing so he became the second most influential man in the history of the world after Jesus. Paul said, him we preach. We don't preach ourselves but we preach Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as servants for his sake. The world would have never remembered a first century Corinthian woman named Chloe nor men named Crispus and Gaius and Stephanus. The world would have never remembered a hospitable, nurturing, pastoral couple named Aquila and Priscilla. The world would have never remembered a timid young preacher named Timothy, nor a talented preacher named Apollos. The world would have never remembered some church leaders named Sopater and Aristarchus and Secundus and Tychicus and Trophimus. And yet, because they became part of something bigger than themselves, their names are immortalized in the pages of the best-selling book in human history. And even better than that, their names are written in heaven in the Lamb's Book of Life. You know, we have an opportunity to go big working together here at Harvest Time. After we're gone, the world might not remember our names. In fact, they will not. But the world will be a better place because we were here. You know what? Because we were here, the landscape of Greenwich, Connecticut has been changed forever. There is now a Jesus-loving, Bible-believing, salvation-preaching, people-reaching church on King Street, and there wasn't one here before. Because we were here, the landscape of Nakuru, Kenya, has been changed. Because we were here, the landscape of Suswa, Kenya, has been changed. Because we were here, the landscape of Kampala, Uganda, has been changed. The landscape of Dakar, Senegal, has been changed. The landscape of Bangladesh and Indonesia and Yangon, Myanmar, and Lutz, Ukraine, has been changed. There are churches and there are schools and there are clinics and there are orphanages and there are water wells where once there was not because we were here. 
You know, because we were here, the religious landscape of this whole town is different. When we built this building, we managed to amend the zoning laws for the entire town of Greenwich in favor of every church. Because we built this building, Stanwich Church was able to build their new building. First Presbyterian Church was able to expand their building. And Christ Church used our consultants to raise money to renovate their building. And after we're gone, phase two will still be standing there as a testimony that there was once a group of people who loved Christ so deeply that they dedicated themselves to something bigger than themselves. In a couple of weeks, we're going to give you a little capsule with a cap on it. And we're going to ask you to take a little piece of paper and write scriptures on it like the wailing wall in Jerusalem and roll them up and seal them in that capsule. And we are going to embed the word of God into the foundation of phase two. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to embed an entire New King James Bible into the foundation of phase two. Pastor Nick wouldn't let me use an NIV, so we're going to put New King James... And listen, we might not be around to guide the decisions of the next generation that will occupy phase two, but if they want to remove the word of God from this building, they are going to have to tear it all the way down to the ground. But even more than buildings left on earth, there will be people in heaven, lots of people in heaven, because we were here and because we became part of something bigger than ourselves. Amen. Principles for going big before you go home. Here's the second principle. If you want to go big, grow big through faithfulness over time. Hidden in these instructions about the collection, I find a key to accomplishing big things in every area of our life. The way to achieve big results in anything is to work towards it incrementally over time. Paul says, here's how we're going to give a big offering to help Jerusalem. Everybody bring a little bit each week, and after a while, it's going to grow into something big. I have discovered lamentably that there is only one way to develop strong muscles, and that is one rep at a time, one set at a time, one workout at a time. Jesus save the church. <laughs> There is only one way to achieve a big balance in your savings account or your retirement account, and it's one deposit at a time. There is only one way to achieve big chops on your musical instrument. It's one practice session at a time. And there is only one way to achieve big things for God on earth. It is through one act of faithfulness at a time. That's good preaching right there. In fact, I'm preaching a little better than you're shouting, but that's all right. I'll shout for both of us. Looking at Paul's instructions, I see some keys to growing big. First of all, grow big by going to church every week. Paul says each one of you should bring an offering to church on the first day of the week, on Sunday. Beloved, listen to me. Sundays are for church. Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week on Sunday and every week since then Christians have met for worship. If Jesus is your Lord, Sunday is not for sleeping in. Sunday is not for sports. Sunday is not for shopping. Sunday is not for baby showers. Sunday is not for the Sunday times. Now I'm preaching to the choir a little bit because you all came here on Sunday. Here's what you need to do. You need to dial someone who stayed at bedside assembly this morning. There is a comforter and you need to say, I want you to listen to this. <laughs> Sundays are for gathering in his name and experiencing his presence. Sundays are for singing the praises of a great God who's greatly to be praised and giving him the glory that is due his name. 
Sundays are for prayer. Sundays are for instruction in the word. Sundays are for fellowship with the saints. Sundays are for instilling faith into your family. If you want to go big, don't stay home. Go to church on Sunday. See, at church, you'll hear a big calling from God. You'll get big ideas and big dreams. You'll hear about big plans that God has for you. Plans to prosper and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. You'll get a big impartation of faith. You know what? You're getting faith right now while you're hearing as the word of God is heard in your ears. Your faith is growing. You'll get a big impartation of the Holy Spirit. You'll get inspired to do big things and you'll get equipped to do big things. Speaking of the New York Times, came across an article recently in which they published the health benefits of regular church attendance. Do you know that attending church regularly boosts your immune system? It lowers your blood pressure, prolongs life by an estimated three years. How many of you like three more years? Lowers the risk of depression and it helps people recover from depression 70% more quickly. Regular church attendance lowers the risk for suicide. It lowers the risk for addiction to alcohol, drugs, and cigarettes. It lowers occurrence of divorce, and it promotes better sex lives among married couples. I'm not sure how they determined it, but that's what they printed. <laughs> Regular church attendance promotes better grades, and it makes people more likely to pursue higher education. It promotes better time and life management skills. And here's my favorite to end. People who attend church regularly are more likely to wear their seatbelts. <laughs> Grow big by going to church every week. Keys to growing big. Another thing I find. Grow big by prioritizing generosity towards God and others. In Paul's instructions about the collection, there are principles to apply to all of our giving. First of all, God wants us to make giving our number one financial priority. You see, all over the Bible, we see this principle of giving to God first. We offer God our first fruits, not our leftovers. And Paul affirms that again when he says here on the first day of the week, bring your offering. Before you do anything else, before you buy anything else, before you pay anything else, before you transact any other business, make an offering to God. Now listen, that doesn't mean that giving will be your biggest disbursement. That would probably be your mortgage and living expenses. But giving should be your number one priority. Along with that, I find in Paul's words that God wants us to plan our giving and not just to give under impulse or under duress. Paul says, plan ahead the offering that you're going to bring. Let it be set aside in the church treasury. That way, when I come, we won't have to scramble and take special offerings. You know, we're people of the Spirit. We like to be moved by the Spirit. We're led by the Spirit. And there are certainly times when the Holy Spirit leads us to be generous spontaneously. But you know, it honors God at another level when we plan to give to Him. It shows Him that we are giving out of our abiding convictions and not out of our fleeting emotions. It shows him that giving is a deeply held value in our hearts. Giving to him is always important to us, not just occasionally important. I find hidden right there another key for growing big. Grow big, living by clear Christian convictions and not by your emotions. There's another thing I find in Paul's words that God wants us to give in proportion to how he's prospered us. If God has given you much, then God wants you to give much. If God hasn't given you so much, then God wants you to give as much as you can and God will grow your capacity to give more. You see, that's the difference between champions and underachievers. Champions don't fret about what they cannot do. Champions concentrate on what they can do. And by so doing, they increase their capacity to do more. 
Underachievers waste their lives waiting for the big break that never comes, but champions invest their lives growing big over time. That's good preaching right there. Amen. Keys to growing big. Go to church, prioritize generosity, live by clear convictions, and another thing, grow big by keeping your commitments. The collection for the suffering saints in Jerusalem was a fulfillment of a commitment that Paul had made to Peter and James and John. Paul made a visit to Jerusalem and the apostles blessed him for ministry to the Gentile world. But before Paul left, they made one request. They said, would you send help for the poor saints in Jerusalem? Paul committed to do that and he kept his promise. The collection was a major focus of Paul's second and third missionary journeys. It was a major topic in Paul's letters. In fact, someone pointed out that Paul actually wrote more in his letters about the collection than he wrote about the great doctrine of justification by faith. And there's a key there. People who keep their commitments, they grow big. The Corinthians had made a commitment to participate in the collection. But after a little while, their resolve to follow through began to waver. So Paul wrote to them again in his second letter, and he said, now finish your commitment. You know, two weeks ago, we celebrated the halfway mark for the Jump In Capital Campaign. And I want to give thanks to God and I want to give thanks to all of you because I'm so blessed to report that at halfway through the campaign, we have ex given exactly half of what was pledged. That's pretty amazing right there. I think that just deserves a, a, a praise. Two weeks ago, some of us reaffirmed the commitments that we made in the fall of 2013. Some of us added to our commitments. Some of us made new commitments for the last half of the campaign through December of 2016. How are we going to keep those commitments? Well, Paul tells us exactly how. By giving a little bit each week. You know, most of us would love to be able to sit down and write a five-figure check or a six-figure check or even a seven-figure check to phase two. Nothing would bring me greater joy than sit, to sit down and write one million dollars to Harvest Time Church. How many of you would love to write that check right there? You know, for most of us, that's not a possibility. But you'd be amazed at how a little bit each week adds up to something big. Listen, if you're behind in your pledge, don't get discouraged. Don't give up. You're probably not going to be able to sit down in December of 2016 and write out a check for the full amount that you committed. But you can plan now to start giving a little bit each week. And you'd be amazed to see how God makes it grow and how God makes you grow. Yes. Keys to growing big. Go to church. Prioritize generosity. Live by convictions. Keep your commitments. Another thing I find, grow big by serving others, especially fellow believers. Don't have time to elaborate, but in 2 Corinthians, Paul calls the collection an act of service for his brothers and sisters in Christ. People who serve others grow big. Jesus said, whatever you do for one another, whatever you do for another brother or sister in Christ, you do directly for me. Keys to growing big. Another thing I find, grow big by practicing gratitude. For Paul, the collection was about gratitude. The Jerusalem church was the birthplace of Christianity. No one had sacrificed more for the sake of the gospel. No one had given more. No one had shed more blood. No one had been more courageous. No one had been more obedient. No one had overcome more cultural prejudices and social barriers than those first Jewish believers in Jerusalem. As Saul watched Stephen draw his last breath, it was Stephen's intercession, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That led to Saul's conversion. Paul owed everything to the love and the faithfulness of the Jerusalem saints whom he once persecuted. 
And everyone who came to faith in Christ through Paul's ministry, they owed that Jerusalem church a debt of gratitude too. And there's a key in here. Grateful people grow big. You know, I believe that one of the reasons that God has blessed Harvest Time is because we have continued to bless our spiritual father and our spiritual mother, Pastor Ray and Pastor Patty Tate. You know, every year we send them an offering just to say thank you. It's not a whole lot of money, but we send it to them to honor them. Every anniversary, every landmark occasion that we've had as a congregation, we have taken the opportunity to bless them again and again. And because we have blessed them, God has blessed us. And if you practice gratitude, God will bless you too. Keys to growing big. Let me give you one final one. Grow big. Mm, this is a hard one. By blessing those who mistreat you. While the Jerusalem church was instrumental in Paul's salvation, it was also the source of Paul's greatest headaches. You see, not everyone in the Jerusalem church appreciated Paul's ministry. They didn't like the fact that he had abandoned the Jewish traditions. They didn't like the fact that he was teaching Gentile men that they didn't have to be circumcised to come to Christ. They didn't like the fact that he had abandoned the kosher dietary rules. They didn't trust Paul's motives. And teachers from the Jerusalem church showed up in all of Paul's churches and they wreaked havoc. They tried to undermine Paul's doctrine and Paul's authority. They cast long shadows of doubt on Paul's ministry. They threatened to undo everything that Paul had worked for. Nevertheless, Paul was determined to bless Jerusalem anyway. Can I tell you personally that I find this one of the hardest commands of Jesus to follow? You know, when someone hurts me, when someone hurts my family, my friends, when someone hurts Harvest Time Church, I want God to hurt them. <laughs> it's like James and John, when they asked Jesus one day, call down lightning from heaven, just zap them, just get them. I, 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 they earned themselves a nickname, the Sons of Thunder. I, I found out that the Sons of Thunders are triplets, James, John, and Glenn. <laughs> but you know, that wasn't the heart of Jesus. That wasn't the heart of Stephen. It wasn't the heart of Paul. Paul had been the recipient of such great mercy. Even while he was a fierce persecutor of the church, Jesus saved him and he could never forget it. That's why he wrote, but God, who is rich in mercy, has saved us. And Paul understood that there's no one who is beyond the reach of the love of God. And so he blessed his enemies. People who bless those who mistreat them will grow big. Beloved, I want to tell you, I want Harvest Time Church to be the biggest church in Greenwich. I want it to be the biggest church in Fairfield County. I want it to be the biggest church in Westchester County. I'm not talking about buildings. I'm not talking about budgets. I'm not talking about attendance. I'm talking about people who are big inside. People who have grown big incrementally by being faithful over time. Let's attend regularly. Let's give generously. Let's live by convictions. Keep our commitments. Serve others. Practice gratitude and bless our enemies. And let's grow big in Christian character and in Christian service. Principles for going big before you go home. Here's the last one. Worship team, come and help me. Here's the last one. Become part of something bigger than yourself. Grow big through faithfulness over time. And here's the last one. If you want to go big, keep on going until you achieve your goal. Paul had big plans to take the gospel west to the ends of the world. Paul had a big project on his heart to take a big collection to Jerusalem. But if you study the book of Acts and you piece together the timeline of Paul's life, you'll discover that neither of those things happened as quickly as Paul had hoped. 
There were all kinds of detours and delays and disasters. Nevertheless, Paul kept going until he achieved his goal. Do you know, Paul spent five years in prison before he was free to travel to Spain. He spent two years in prison in Judea. That was the thanks he got for delivering the offering. And then he spent one year on a prison transport trying to get to Rome and another two years under house arrest in Rome awaiting trial before Caesar. But finally God delivered him from the lion's mouth and after delays and detours and disasters, Paul finally achieved his goal. Paul worked on the collection for at least six years, possibly eight years. He wrote to the Corinthians once and then he had to write to them a second time. Let your completion match your good intention. There's a good word right there. Let your completion match your good intention. In other words, finish what you set out to accomplish. What God put in your heart to do, God is more than able to help you to finish. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the beginning and the end of our journey. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that at all times you have everything you need to abound to every good work. Oh, the Corinthians, they wavered a little bit in their resolve, but they kept on going and they reached their goal. And so shall we. I want to close with the true story of a young businessman who gave his life to Christ in the mid 1960s. When he found Christ, he was on the verge of losing everything, his marriage, his business, and when Christ came into his life, everything turned around. It's funny how that happens. Out of gratitude, he set a goal to give $1 million to missions over the course of his lifetime. This was on top of his ties. This was on top of building projects that he was part of or any other charity. And he started giving towards that goal a little bit at a time. The years passed and his family grew up and his business grew bigger and his capacity to give grew larger. So he gave a little bit more at a time. Do you know it took him 38 years? But one Sunday as he was recording his weekly giving in a journal that he kept, he realized that that week he was crossing over the one million dollar mark. Now remember, this is giving to missions. It's on top of his tithe. It's on top of building projects. And he looked up to heaven and he thanked God for blessing him so much to help him meet that goal. And then the next Sunday, he took out a brand new, fresh journal and he recorded his first check towards the next million dollars to missions. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because we know that our labors are not in vain in the Lord. Go big before you go home. Think big. Dream big. Envision big. Plan big. Live big. Become part of something bigger than yourself. Grow big over time and keep on going until you achieve big for the glory of God. Would you stand on your feet and would you give Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place today.